So actually, uh, Sunny has uh, covered a lot of the ground, no? So this is an integrative study, just to give a background. Uh, Philippines uh, was not alone in conducting this benchmarking study because precisely the benchmarking is against other countries also with significant livestock, poultry, and dairy industries in the region. So these countries, uh, as it turned out, were China, Thailand, and Vietnam. Uh, there's other countries, but the logistical uh, issues with uh, engaging experts in these countries uh, well, proved too difficult. So, but th these are already uh, quite, uh, uh, you know, meaningful comparators for Philippines, no? Uh, we, uh, the, the data and the assessments reported in this presentation uh, came from uh, these experts that were engaged. So PIDS uh, did this in collaboration with a regional center for research, the CIRCA, the Southeast Asian Regional Center for Graduate Studies and uh, Research in Agriculture. Uh, they were the ones uh, responsible for engaging the experts in Vietnam, uh, Thailand, and China. So uh, with that spiel, I'll try to, um, having listened to uh, Sunny's presentation and knowing, uh, of course, his, his paper, uh, which is the country study for Philippines, uh, I will try to avoid repeating uh, uh, things that are uh, already discussed and try to bring in new material from the country papers of the other countries. Next. Oh, okay. So that showed the uh, discussion paper slide. Uh, if, if you want to see the details, because I'll be going through this rather quickly, I hope, uh, that, that's the discussion paper to download. So we're going to cover uh, swine chicken and the profile of dairy, um, the, more the, the more meaty part of the analysis looking at costs and returns. So this is swine chicken, corn, uh, special mention. This was also mentioned in uh, Sunny's uh, presentation and dairy. So of course, when we present this, we'll present this as a cross country comparison. No? And lastly, developing the livestock, poultry and dairy industries. Although perhaps uh, I may go through this rather quickly because of the large overlap. Naturally, the, the overlap is not because we didn't say anything new, it's because we coordinated our studies, right? So <laughs> whatever is asserted uh, benchmarking, domestic benchmarking study, for Philippines is consistent with the overall integrative study recommendations. Next. So looking now at the swine industry. So again, Philippines, quick review. Uh, we have uh, earlier round of disease problems, growth, and then the most severe problem historically now with the African swine fever. Backyard production is the dominant uh, share Recently, commercial grid grown pork has been increasing uh, until, of course, the African swine fever. We reached nearly 2 million tons of total supply taken together in 2019, supply imports and consumption. But actually, we have fallen off from that because of the uh, local supply shock. Uh, this has not been enough to meet domestic demand. So imports have been an upward trend over the decade of the 2010s. Uh, <coughs> The, the growth of imports have been averaging 9%. Next. All right, comparing internationally. So global perspective. China is the top global producer of pork. So if, if we had 2 million tons odd, no? Uh, they have 43 million tons, no? Vietnam is even bigger than us, 3.3 million tons. Uh, Thailand, not so big, no? Less than a million tons. Uh, however, these figures I'm citing 2019 are already figures affected by uh, African swine fever, which has not affect, which has not been unique to Philippines, but has also severely affected China and Vietnam. Uh, at the time of the study, uh, Thailand was uh, not yet severely affected by African swine fever. Uh, in, in Thailand, uh, we still have uh, largely small scale production. 92% of swine uh, growers uh, own below 50 head, but actually these uh, 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 herd sizes are still larger than average in, in Philippines. Uh, similarly, China and uh, Vietnam small scale. However, we've seen since uh, 20, especially in 2021, 22, 
African swine fever is forcing consolidation of the swine industry, which is quite the opposite, apparently, of what's happening here. Here, what's been closing down are the commercials and expanding are the backyards. But in Thailand, uh, it was reported that what was growing there are, are the commercial uh, and the shutdown of the most small scale producers. Uh, af after the severe, after they got their own severe outbreak of African swine fever starting at 2022. Next. Okay, M moving on to a profile of the uh, chicken or broiler industry. So this was an upward trend in the 2010s until the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm not mentioning the African swine fever because that doesn't affect chicken. But the COVID-19 pandemic did affect on the demand side, uh, to a large extent because uh, there was a decline in demand from institutional buyers, the, uh, the Jollibees, the Mang Inasals, because people aren't going out anymore to patronize these, uh, these restaurants no, and food chains. Uh, different from uh, swine, native chicken, well, in, including the improved breeds of native chicken, is, is about 45% of the total production. There's very, very significant reliance on native or native-based breeds. Uh, and the, as, as mentioned by Sunny, this is largely, it's a commercially dominated operation, but still about a fifth of the industry produced by backyard operators. Next. So again, China, just like with swine, is the top global producer of chicken. However, its chicken production has been declining in contrast with that of Vietnam and Thailand, where up to 2020, uh, we can see a rising trend. You know? So we can say that the chicken production in China had uh, somewhat peaked, you know? uh, unlike uh, in, in, in Thailand and Vietnam, and even in the Philippines. Next. Okay, moving now finally to the dairy industry. So I think it has been mentioned already in the previous presentation, dairy production in the country has been growing, but still very, very far below the uh, milk consumption needs of the country. So most of our consumption is being imported. So it's almost 100% dependent on imports. Uh, milk production is uh, mostly organized by backyard operators. Uh, mostly organized in co into cooperatives. So if you define them as commercial, that's fine. Uh, to its credit, it is the Philippine Carabao uh, uh, Center and the National Dairy Authority that have been uh, responsible for organizing uh, the, the dairy producers into cooperatives, respectively for the two main sources, namely cattle and buffalo. Uh, Carabao, no? Next. All right, uh, dairy international scene. Again, China, well, of course, China, one point, the most populous country on earth. So no wonder it's the top global producer of everything, including uh, milk. And it mostly produces milk from cattle, uh, producing about 35 million tons in 2019. Uh, and its production is on a largely, uh, mostly on a large scale basis. Thailand, it produced 1.2 million tons of, uh, milk, all from cattle, uh, but it still imports a lot of milk. Uh, its import dependency ratio is 60%. Uh, so these are all, of course, very tiny compared with the milk production in China. Vietnam is also around 1 million tons. But in Thailand and Vietnam, output has been rising. But China, just like with chicken, no, uh, output has not been consistently increasing. In fact, it's been on a kind of a downward, slight downward trend. Uh, unlike in China, in Vietnam and Thailand, production is still mostly small scale. So 66% of dairy households in Vietnam, say, are in the small scale category. Next. Okay, moving now to uh, cost and returns. So as far as we can gather, so we, we were not able to get new data. We mostly relied as much as possible on existing uh, data gathered by other uh, farm budget studies uh, in Philippines and, and the, in the countries uh, covered by the assessment. So we reached, so we converted values as much as possible to comparable units, pesos, so that it would be easily understood by Philippine audience. So the best we can estimate the average cost in 2018 per kilogram of swine meat in carcass weight. So we have to be careful whether it's live weight or carcass weight. So if you're thinking, oh, that, that price doesn't compare with the price I know in my mind, uh, take into consideration this is a dead weight, no? 
So 148 pesos for the backyard, but much lower, 112.4 for commercial operators. And why is that happening? Uh, we did the assessment and it's because the, the commercial operators have a much larger output, which reduces the, some of the fixed costs from utilities, labor and rent. <clears throat> Meanwhile, we, so this already conf, uh, confirms the uh, presence of uh, re returns to um, economies of scale, right? In the case of Philippines. And we check uh, cost of returns estimates for China, Thailand, and Vietnam. And we do also confirm the presence of economies of scale, meaning large scale operations tend to have lower per unit costs. So here's a table, next, that uh, provides some details. We reduced, as I said, everything to common currency units. So we have here uh, operating costs for small scale tend to be larger uh, across the board uh, in, in whatever country. So let's say Vietnam, 134 pesos uh, per unit per kilogram uh, dead uh, carcass weight uh, for small scale, but for large scale, the same operating cost is down to 120 pesos. Now, where is it mostly coming from? Uh, across the countries, the largest share is feeds followed by the cost of the uh the the the, the, the pig the piglet the, the stock right that, that's that, that's grown up no so this is the the, the piglet uh, is, is a significant share of the cost there's also labor veterinary supplies utilities and others but the the, the first two i mentioned are the largest share of the cost um Price also varies widely you know, uh, across the countries. Philippines tends to have the highest price in 2018. In China, averaged over the period studied is uh, pretty cheap, you know, uh, along with Thailand. Uh, th Vietnam is in between. So therefore, uh, there are large variations in cost per kilogram. There are also large variations in price per kilogram. There's also large variations in net revenue per kilogram, which is a... Uh, an indicator of profitability uh, engaging in engaging in this business uh, across these countries. So yeah, uh, Philippines is a higher cost producer compared with Thailand and China, but somewhat uh, lower cost producer compared with Vietnam for the large scale farms. Next. Okay, I think this summarizes uh, what I just mentioned. Uh, note, in particular, the third bullet point, feed cost is high, higher in the Philippines compared with the other countries. Now, we're presenting studies from uh, China which had these detailed breakdowns. If we get the estimate, summary estimates from other studies and we compare, this seems to be way off the mark compared with, the, so we did the conversion uh, from Euro to, to Peso in 2018. Uh, global export readers. So who are the biggest exporters of pork in the world? They're mostly in EU. Uh, and, uh, one of them is Spain, Denmark, Belgium, and they're producing at the level of below 90 pesos. So here, Spain and Denmark at 86.50 in peso equivalent uh, for that year. Next. Moving now to chicken, and we isolate broiler. So uh, not the native, but the commercial broiler, not even the layers, the eggs, but just the broiler, no? So as with swine, economies of scale allow commercial broilers to reduce cost per kilogram of broiler for largely the same reasons. Uh, so we're at 71 pesos per kilogram. Now we're reckoning this in live weight, okay? For the commercial uh, operator, higher 78 pesos for the backyard operators. Uh, commercial production involves a lower cost of feed per kilogram. So somehow the larger operators are able to economize on cost of feed on a per kilogram basis. And of course the overhead costs are divided by a larger output. So again, utilities, rent and labor. Next. Okay, so similar table as before, uh, you can see now. Uh, Philippines turns out to be not so bad uh, for small-scale farms compared with small-scale farms in China, Thailand, uh, and Vietnam. Uh, Large-scale farms doing a little bit worse 
compared with China uh, and um, yeah, compared with everybody. Okay, so our small scale farms are not doing that bad according to the figures we've gotten. But the large scale farms are uh, kind of producing at a higher cost compared with the other large scale farms in the other countries. Unfortunately, 80% of the broiler production is in these large scale farms. And you can see here, just like with swine, largest share is, uh, uh, of the cost is coming from feeds and also the, the stocks, no? The equivalent here is the day old chicks that they grow into from one day old to about 30 days or so uh, for broilers that they can sell uh, to, to the market. And then the rest are produced, uh, are, are uh, uh, comprised of the labor, veterinary supplies, et cetera. So you can see uh, cost of feeds here is not highest uh, among the countries, uh, but still higher than that of Vietnam. But the cost of day old chicks for some reason in Philippines is higher than in the other countries. Uh, I think in Philippines, we, the, the, the day old chick is being dominated by just two uh, um, suppliers for the entire uh, uh, broiler industry. Next. Okay, so this is the summary uh, that uh, what I just said, no, next. All right, now let me just review or, or emphasize some point about corn in the, in the livestock and poultry value chain. It's been discussed earlier, but reflecting some international comparisons. So we, we could see from the previous tables that feed is the main driver of cost and the main driver of feed cost turns out to be maize, no? Although there are other uh, ingredients there, uh, like uh, soybean, for example. Uh, but still, uh, it, it, maize is the majority. Uh, from time to time, we do import a lot of wheat uh, and, and convert it into feed, uh, depending on the relative prices of uh, maize and wheat. But on average, it's still maize, no? Notice that uh, the price per 50 kilogram of swine feed in the exporting countries in the EU range from uh, 13,000 to 16,000 in 2018. Uh, sorry, this is, uh, I, I, sorry, I forgot to uh, correct this. This is on a per ton basis. So in Philippines in 2018, the price, uh, 2017, the prices ranged, depending on the, because there are large varieties of feed, no, for swine, between 1,000 to 1,800. So let's consider, let's say, 15,000 pesos for a ton. How does that uh, work out? So that's uh, 1,500 per 100 kilograms or 75 Seven thousand seven hundred fifty pesos per per fifty kilogram sack. So uh, quite a significant difference uh, compared to uh, the the price of uh, feed. So uh, the the differences in maize price reflect in differences in feed price, which is one of the reasons uh, why Philippine uh, uh, livestock industry and poultry is not very competitive. Next, okay. Uh, in Philippines, if you look at the maize prices uh, at the time of the study, and I think it's still elevated, uh, between uh, 42 to 44 cents per kilogram. Uh, in China, it's between 28 to 38 cents per kilogram. Uh, even lower in Vietnam, 22 up to 29. And lowest probably range is 19 to 24 in Thailand. No? Um, Philippines is unable to benefit from the low cost of imported corn owing to high corn tariffs, which is 50% out quota rate, 35% in quota under uh, if the corn is imported with the minimum under within the minimum access volume of 217,000 tons. Now we are able to set that uh, tariff rate down to 5% if we import from another ASEAN country. And indeed, up to 80% of what we do import comes from other ASEAN countries, uh, a large part from, from Thailand and a little bit from, from Indonesia. But, uh, uh, you know, it's not as abundant compared with uh, imports from uh, other countries. Uh, if we can import, say, from North America uh, and other countries, then that we, we will be able to access lower cost uh, wheat, but instead we have this 50% rates 
uh, that, that, that I mentioned earlier. Next. Okay, moving on to cost and returns for dairy. So uh, moving away from maize, which is not really a big factor in, in dairy industry. So it has its own uh, uh, idiosyncrasies. So according to Picard, uh, it, there's a decent profit that can be made over the long run when you consider all the various outputs of uh, a, a dairy concern. So in addition to the milk, you have byproducts of meat. Uh, and this is assuming, so a very crit critical indicator here is productivity or yield, which is reckoned in liters of milk on a daily basis. So uh, the Picard estimate was 10 liters per day, which is round about what we are getting from other small scale dairy producers in Thailand. But in China, uh, with their mostly large scale producers, they're getting 15 liters per day uh, and a little bit higher uh, in Vietnam at 16 to 17 liters per day. Next. So that's cattle moving on to Carabao also, uh, the, 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 all of that stuff is saying that there is also uh, some decent returns on ideal scale using their typical farm estimate. Uh, however, uh, in our observation from doing consultations, ordinary uh, Carabao farmers have difficulty replicating exactly this profit stream. No? So if you can replicate this stream at the semi-commercial scale, you'll be profitable. However, uh, because of... Uh, you know, there's the problem of disease, lower than 10, 10 liters per day productivity and so on. Sometimes many farmers are unable to replicate these favorable profit streams or income streams. Next. All right, so uh, development issues. First, the policy environment. I think it's been mentioned here, uh, regulating the industry to safeguard human and animal health. Uh, it's also been mentioned that these regulations tend to be more strictly enforced among the commercials, not really in the backyard. Then there's a stringent uh, ASF management program. Uh, however, it's been said that during the time the study was conducted, less successful than a similar program in Thailand, which uh, had a more generous spending for disease management in 2021. 2022, they had actually uh, nationwide, I believe, outbreaks which is, as I said, forced some consolidation of the industry. Next. All right, so except for dairy, so dairy has strong government support on a per liter, say, of uh, milk basis. Uh, but for swine and uh, livestock, uh, swine and uh, chicken, uh, the government has mostly relied on the private sector to promote the development of these industries. So for dairy, the government support is R&D, uh, importation of breeder animals, organization of cooperatives was mentioned, and so on. Uh, scale of milk feeding in Philippines. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, there's also under the National Feeding Program a provision in the law to link local dairy production to the National School Feeding Program. But again, it suffers in comparison with a similar program in Thailand, which is much larger in scale and much greater percentage of dairy farmers uh, in Thailand are able to produce milk through their processing cooperatives to serve their uh, national milk, school milk feeding scheme. Next. So if you're if you a Thai person, you would if, say of my age, you would know about this because you would have grown up drinking all the milk. Uh, coming uh, from, from this scheme. Next. All right, so these recommendations, maybe I can glance through this quickly because uh, these also have been covered in Sunny's uh, recommend, set of recommendations. Review of trade policies, get the tariffs and earmark it for the development from, from pork and chicken imports and uh, earmark it for regulatory services and production support, invest more heavily in research and data collection, develop Institutional capacity in government, say, able to enforce and provide advice on biosecurity, for instance. Next. Reset the oversight system in terms of over the LPD industries. I would like to emphasize stronger regulations on zoning. So rather than flashing the pan, movement restrictions, when there is a big crisis, why not force the LGUs? Uh, to, uh, to be more specific and zone the, uh, the swine zone, the 
the poultry zone in contiguous areas so that you can more easily manage the biosecurity and whatever other facilities, say shared service facility for dressing and slaughter uh, that you would, uh, would like to convey for these industries. So through these consolidated arrangements, you can uh, uh, promote upgraded technology and promote stronger farmer organizations to be able to access uh, these uh, services and regulatory support and, and services, sorry, uh, regulations that government is uh, imposing or be able to comply better, you know, and realize uh, and it's also for their benefit that they can realize gains from economies of scale and scope, meaning uh, integrating backwards to feed production and forwards to uh, marketing. So with that, I conclude uh, this presentation. Thank you.